Four. Welcome to our study uh, in the book of Romans. This is Sonship Orientation. This is session number 105. What we're going to do is jump right in and look at the two verses that we're looking at in level three of the education. And that would be in Proverbs 1, verses 5 and 6. And so here they are. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Now, in fact, I can even use this thing now. We've come through an orientation that's moved us all the way up to being a wise man. You know, we talked about last time what it is that wise man is going to hear that will result in increased learning. And we're not so much talking about his increase in learning. He will learn something. But we're talking about as a father passing that on to a son and a son beginning to learn. That's the increased learning that's taking place there. And when, and when that happens, he becomes a man of understanding. Now that is the last appellative or name that you're, you're never going to move beyond being a man of understanding. And, uh, and, and as we get to that, what we need to do is we need to talk about what it means uh, in the terminology of a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. In fact, let me just put that verse up with that highlighted because I think we've covered the first part of that pretty well. And it says, a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Now, I'm going to tell you now, and we're going to emphasize this more as we go through today, that the wise counsels is the main primary goal that your Heavenly Father has been after since He started this curriculum with you. I'm going to say this to you in a couple of different ways today, and, I'm going to, and, I, and I'll repeat it because I want you to have it firmly in your mind, but for right now, I'm going to say it like this. Yes, back here to become a simple son, you did learn these four decision-making skills, but when your father started this education, when he wrote this curriculum, when he had this plan to adopt you and educate you as a son, it was not ultimately so that you would just make wise decisions. Yes, you will. But that's, that's not what was in his mind. And it wasn't about just you gaining subtlety to see below the surface about your father's business or even the policy of evil it, and, 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 and solving that one-dimensional problem you had here. It wasn't about that either. And it wasn't about you learning that you had a reputation, that knowledge that you have a reputation in the heavenly places and that you need to conduct yourself in accordance with that reputation and you're going to need discretion because the policy of evil is going to try to ruin your reputation through not just some big sin that you're going to commit, but even through just an indiscretion. That's, those things are all part of the curriculum, and yes, I'm not, I'm not saying they're not, they're not necessary. They are. But those things are not... Because, and you say, well, once I get that, I'm, full, I'm going to be fully educated in the Father's business. I'll be able to go up there and do anything He wants me to do. And that's true. But that is still not... I know that sounds crazy, because what you're saying is, you, you, you might be thinking this, wait a minute. We're supposed to learn to think, live, and labor with our Father. That's the three components of godliness. And you're saying that the final goal of this thing was not so that we could labor with Him? Right. There's something beyond that. Those are the three components to godliness. But there is something beyond that. Now I know up till this point, you've been thinking the ultimate goal is for me to get this education so that when I get up there, I can conduct all of my father's business just the way he would. And that is an important thing. Don't diminish that in your mind by what I'm saying. That is important, but there is something beyond even that. 
And it's described right here in the yellow type on the PowerPoint that a man of understanding, which is the ultimate appellative you'll achieve to, shall attain unto wise counsels. And if you'll notice the way this thing is stair-stepped, you have this man of understanding. Now, he's not ever going to change from being that. He is a man of understanding. But there is one more thing up here, and that is the wise counsels. And that's the thing that we're going to be kind of looking at and examining and working our way toward that. Now, in order to take this whole thing so that you really understand it, I want to take, about, I want to take a, that word understanding and talk to you about that. A man of understanding. And so this is, uh, I really need that other color marker, but it doesn't matter. It's this word understanding that I want you to get. Because most of the time, when we talk about understanding, what do you think of? What, Beverly? Huh? Comprehending. Comprehending. Sure, isn't that what you, sure. That's what you would normally think of. But there is another meaning to the word understanding, and you know me, in this case, because of the context of what's happening and the way that it's being used here, it is, I'm not saying the guy doesn't understand, comprehend some things. He does. But to be a man of understanding, there's more at work here than just comprehending something. Let me tell you why. Because it is possible. Just take a regular father-son in the workplace, and the father explains this thing to the son, and the son walks away saying, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but so what? What's the big deal? See, comprehension alone is not going to serve him this way. There's another way that understanding gets used. Did it come to your mind? <laughs> okay, I'm seeing this action coming. All right, there's another way that understanding, and by the way, it involve, this kind of understanding involves two parties. Does that surprise you? Why does it surprise you? Because this is a father-son relationship. Have you ever said about two people, we have come to an understanding? Now, I want to talk about that kind of meaning when it comes to understanding. Because that's the way this word is being used here. You're not just a man that comprehends. You do comprehend. But it's more than that. This kind of understanding, folks, is a harmonious agreement with your Heavenly Father about all the things that He is thinking and saying about this education. In other words, it's not just, well, I understand what He's saying, but that doesn't, it doesn't, it's not that big a deal to me. <coughs> when you say... I, I understand this the same way my Heavenly Father understands this. You finally get it. You, yeah, okay, but, uh, Gloria says, we, you finally get it. You come to an understanding, and when the Father says to you, this is really important, you see it the same way. You understand it that way. And so, it's, it's, it, do you see now how it has to go beyond just comprehending. And by the way, what I'm talking about is a real dictionary definition of understanding because this word, like so many others, is used in more than one way. And this is a, this is a real definition of the term. I, I'll actually give it to you a, a little later as we do that. Now, one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to give you an example of talking about the same thing but not coming to the same conclusion. Because in this curriculum, folks, when your father's talking to you about something, and, and, and he not only expects you to understand or comprehend what he's saying to you, but to really be in concert with him about this, to, act, to think about it the same way he thinks about it, to come to that understanding with him, 
I want to show you how this can happen where you don't come to the same conclusion about it. All right, now look. This, there's a dangerous area here. The dangerous area is seeing the things that you're told and coming to your conclusion about it instead of coming to your father's conclusion about it. Let me show you how this can work. I'm going to take you to two different people who are talking about the same subject and they're going to reference an Old Testament verse and they're going to reference the same verse and they're going to come to two different conclusions. So let's take a look. The first one is going to be in Acts chapter 2 and this is going to be the Apostle Peter. In Acts 2, you already know what program are you in. You're in the Israel program. Important to remember. Now look at Acts 2. But Peter, by the way, let me just set it up for you. He's going to be talking about the resurrection. And the Old Testament scripture he's going to quote is out of Psalm 1610. And he's going to be preaching the resurrection of Christ. So here it is. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. Now I'm going to skip you down to verse 23 to get to the part in his sermon here. And it says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up. There's the resurrection, yes? Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him. There's, here comes your psalm reference, because that's what was recorded by David. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face is my right hand. I should not be moved, because... Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. In other words, Jesus wasn't going to be left when he died. He wasn't going to be left in the tomb and his body was going to decay away. But there was a promise that God made all the way back to David that said he would raise up his Christ to sit on David's throne. Does anybody know what that promise, what, what that's contained in? When God promised that to David, that's part of what? The yeah, the Davidic covenant. Sure. And so look what he says. Verse 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. That would be true, right? He says... Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, there's the Davidic covenant part, God swore with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, in other words, this person was going to be in the line of David, yes? Of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to do what? To sit on David's throne. You tell me what is going to be going on when Christ is sitting on the throne of David. The kingdom? Yeah. This is the, king. this is the promise of the Christ sitting on the throne of David in the kingdom. And you know what he's saying? God raised him up to do that. Look, he would raise up Christ to do what? Sit on his throne. He's seen this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So you see what David's talking about? He is saying, hey, that when David made that, that prophecy back in Psalm 16, that his soul wouldn't be left in, his hell, in hell and his flesh wouldn't see corruption, it was because God swore an oath to David that he would raise up Christ to sit on David's throne in the kingdom. Everybody got that? Now let's see how Paul preaches the resurrection. 
And you know what he's going to do? He's not only going to preach the resurrection, he's going to use the same Old Testament verse, Psalm 1610. And he's going to come to a completely different conclusion. So here we go with this. This is going to be Acts chapter 13, and look with me in verse 16. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. Now the reason I gave you that first verse, I'm going to skip you down to verse 28, same reason I did with Peter, I want you to see who's talking. So he says in verse 28, And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. You know he's talking about Christ here. He's rehearsing that event. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. There's the resurrection, yes? Then, verse 35, Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. That's out of Psalm 1610. He's referencing the same psalm. Verse 36, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Isn't that what Peter was saying? David's dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us to this day. Paul is saying David fell asleep and was laid unto his fathers, and guess what happened to his body? It corrupted. Then verse 37, But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. There's the Psalm 1610 reference. Are you with me so far? Okay, now look. Be it known unto you, therefore, there's that English word logic, in view of what we just got through talking about, here's what you ought to know, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you that he will sit on David's throne. No. In the dispensation of grace, Paul preaches the resurrection as the, that this man has preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. You know what he's preaching over there in Acts 13? That the resurrection of Christ was so that you could be justified. Did he mention the throne of David or the kingdom at all? They're both preaching the resurrection. They're both quoting Psalm 1610. And I'm going to give you one more reference for Paul because you're looking at that and if you're saying, I'm not sure that's what Paul's saying. Well, he's going to say it again. He's going to say it a lot clearer. Take a look at this, Romans 4.25. We've been through this passage. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for what? Our justification. So when Paul preaches the resurrection and quotes 16.10, he says he didn't corrupt in the grave because he was raised for your justification. You've been justified unto eternal life because he rose from the dead. Here's what Peter preached to Israel. He rose from the dead because he's going to sit on the throne of David in the kingdom. Same subject, same Old Testament reference, two different conclusions. That is not coming to an understanding. <laughs> you say, well, what, is that a mistake? No, no. Well, by the way, which one of those is true? Thank you. Both of those are true. How can, the, how can two different things be true? Because one of them is for Israel's program. The other one is for the body of Christ, the mystery program. But the resurrection does them both. Now, I showed you that just to show you how you can take the same subject and take the same verses and not come to a meeting of the minds on it. Do you see what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to do is say to you, this man of understanding right here is not a guy that's really smart and the father comes to this conclusion, but he takes the same information and comes to this conclusion. That's not what this is being talked about. What a man of understanding is, he is coming to the very conclusion 
that his father is coming to. And I'm not talking about he says, well, he's my father and I don't really see it, but I'm just going to go ahead and agree with it. I'm not talking about that either. I'm talking about when he sees all the information, what he concludes is the same thing his father concluded. He doesn't need to be persuaded that this is right. He knows. Knows on his own. And he, and he doesn't know just because it was his father. He knows because he's able to look at the things that are given to him and say, I mean, if I said, what's three and three, you would all say six. Okay, most of you would say six. But it, because you understand the information all leads us to the same conclusion. That's the point I'm trying to make when we're talking about a man of understanding that he is coming to that kind of a conclusion and so the understanding this man of understanding is a man that sees the curriculum the same way his father sees it he he comprehends it the same way his father comprehends it but I'm going to give you another dimension to this he doesn't just and if I can just kind of lay it out like this he doesn't just think the same about it. He does something else. Ooh. He feels the same way about it. And you understand there's a difference here between how you feel about something and how you think. He's not just thinking about it that way. He feels about it the same way the Father does. Have you ever talked to somebody about something and you realize they don't feel about it the, the way you do? I do that with sonship all the time. I talk to someone about sonship. I know how I feel about it. And with them, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, I don't really need that. I make pretty good decisions on my own. It, 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 if I could just step aside from the narrative of this lesson just for a second and talk about that issue just for a second. When I first try to talk to somebody about sonship, I can't jump them to the things we're going to be looking at today in level three. You know, the only thing I can do is try to jump them to something early on they can identify with. And so I say something like this. Once you get sonship, you won't wonder what God's will is. You'll know God's will. Not only that, but the decisions that you will make will be under godly wisdom, and you won't ever have to wonder about what to do. Well, they hear that and they think, I already make really good decisions. Well, in the world, yes. But if you think those decisions qualified you to count beans in the heavenly places, you would be sadly mistaken. That, that wisdom won't get you anywhere. If it did, then the smartest people in the world would be the folks God would just put into positions. The smartest people in the world aren't going to be qualified for anything unless they've gone through the sonship curriculum. Because, as I say to them, you can't learn this anywhere else. You can't go to the University of Texas and learn this education. Sad part is every church is supposed to be teaching this. You can't even go to every church and learn this education. But, but, here, but to get back on point, you see how people, they hear, the, they hear that, but they don't feel about it the way I do. There's something missing. Well, okay, okay. I mean, I'm not trying to throw them under the bus. I, what I'm really trying to say is, you're, when you're a man of understanding, you not only think about this, and by the way, by this time, you have both sides of the coin, right? You not only see the education from the standpoint of a son, but now you're taught from the standpoint of a father, and you're looking at the whole thing, and you're saying, I think about this whole thing just the way my father thinks about it, and I feel about it the way he feels about it. That's, the whole, that's coming to an understanding. Do you, you see what I'm saying? That's the definition of the term that I'm really trying to get you to. And, and so it's, it's, it's much more than just comprehending uh, the material. And what I'm going to do now is take you to another passage of Scripture 
because I want to give you an, an illustration of this, that you feel the same way that your father does. But in order to talk to you about this, I have to set it up because when we get back over here to do our sonship establishment, to perceive the words of understanding in Romans 8, you're going to be immediately confronted with some passages. And I'm not going to get into them today, and you don't need to have an anxiety attack over this, okay? You can do that when we get back over into these verses. But when you're reading that verse that's in there for everybody to read that says, we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us according to the will of God, and that, you know, and there's a groanings that cannot be uttered, and, and, and you start getting into that, there is a thing that is introduced to you after that called the searching of the heart. And the reason that he can write a verse that will be true for everybody is because he knows that you haven't been fully confronted with this issue yet. And so then you find out about this thing called the searching of the heart. Now, folks, when we get back over to Romans 8, I'm going to show you how this works. I'm going to walk right through the Scripture with it. Don't be anxious about it now. But in order to illustrate this, I'm going to take you back to a psalm, Psalm 139. And that's a psalm that when we get back over to that part in Romans 8, we're going to come back to and look at because Paul's counting on the fact you already know the things that are listed in Psalm 139. We haven't spent that time yet. And we're not going to do it. We're going to wait till we get to this thing about the searching of the heart in Romans 8 before we go back over there. But I do want to take you to show you this part. Because that's sitting right there in Psalm 139. So as, as David starts out in this psalm, let me tell you what he's doing because we're not going to read the whole psalm. When David starts out in this psalm, here's what he's doing. He is talking to his heavenly father and he is praying in a sonship way. And what does that mean? It means he is going over his day with his father. It would be just like coming in from, from work at the end of the day. Or when you're a kid coming in from school and your parents saying, what'd you do today? And you go, well, I know what, the, you know what, here's what kids really do. Not much. That's the end of that. But if you're really going to talk about that day, then you would sit down and you go like, you know, we had a really odd or interesting discussion today. Because the teacher was saying such and such, and then so-and-so said this, and we all kind of had a discussion about And you begin to talk about this issue, you know, and, and all like that. Well, that's what David's doing. He is doing sons, what you're going to learn to do in sonship prayer, is you're going to learn to take all the things that happen during the day. Now, not, not everything, because many of our days are the same way. I find myself saying to my Heavenly Father, I'm fixing to do again right now what I did every day this week. <laughs> you know, I'm fixing to sit down here and go to work. And he doesn't, you know, I don't need to make up stuff about that. You know, you would, you know, you, you talk to him like a father. But David is rehearsing those things, and then he's going to make a change. And when he makes this change, he's going to quit talking about what has happened, and he's going to talk about what he's going to do tomorrow in view of what he understands. That's, and so now, with that, with that understanding, let me drop you to Psalm 139. And we're going to take it up in verse 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I am awake, I am still with thee. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God! Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. Now, I want you to take a look um, in verse 19. Look at that one, two, three. Look at that third word. What is it? All right. Now, let me take you back to the front of this psalm. Uh, well, I'm not. Let me do this, and I'll take you back to the front of the psalm because I've got it in this order. Verse 19, Surely that will slay the wicked, O God. 
Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Now, you notice how he starts out here. God, they're your enemies, and here's what they're doing against you. Verse 21. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. Am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Is that not a description about how David feels about it? Yeah. And what he's going to say here is, I feel about this situation the same way I think you feel about this situation. He's going to come along after this and he's going to ask God to search his heart about this issue to make sure that he is actually thinking about it and feeling about it the same way his father does. Because if he's missed something, he wants, he doesn't, he wants to be a proper son. He, doesn't, you know, doesn't, he wants to get it. And so he's going to go through that. Let me see where I'm taking you next. Let me just look ahead here. Oh, this is where I'm going to take you back. If you look again at verse 19, I included it on this one. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked. Now look back, back up. Why is that being there? That I've missed a verse. Psalm 139. Let me just turn to it. Evidently, I omitted it out of the PowerPoint, and that's why I was stumbling about it a minute ago, because I thought I ought to have actually had it first. Psalm 139. And if you look, look at verse 1 in Psalm 139. I can't believe I left this out of the PowerPoint. I'm counting the word O as a word. What's the fourth word? What does that tell you? Past tense. When you get to verse 19, the third word is? And what is that? Ah, now do you see the change? At first he was talking about things that have already happened. When you get to verse 19, now he changes and says, now I'm going to talk about things that haven't happened yet. Now I'm going to talk about the future. This is a great illustration of sonship prayer because you are going to get used to doing this. At the end of your day, you're going to have made some sonship decisions. And you're going to, at the end of the day, you're going to meet with your heavenly Father and you're going to go over those decisions. You're going to say, here's what I, here's what I did and here's how that turned out. You know, some of those will be better than others. And, but, but then you'll come to a place where you'll say, and now here's, I know I have some decisions to make tomorrow, and here's what I'm thinking about with regard to that. And then you're going to ask your father, am I headed in the right direction here or not? And there really is something to be learned about sonship prayer that you don't have to go away from that guessing. Searching of the heart will help. Yes. Right. I'm just, I'm it up to him. You know what? That's a that's a good that's a good thing to point out because in this in the in, in what happens today, people are like, "What do you want me to do tomorrow?" Yeah. Whereas David is saying, "Here's what I'm planning on doing tomorrow. Is, it right, is this the right thing to do?" Because what he's trying to do is come to an understanding. He wants to be thinking about this the way his father does. Because when you're... Can you see how this would be important, especially early on in your sonship, when you're learning these decision-making skills and putting them to work? It's like anything else. The first time you get on the bike, you know, the thing is shaking and you're all over the place, you know, and, and, and you're not, you know, very steady or certain with it. But after a while, you know, you're going to refine that process. You're still going to... By the way, the searching of the heart is something you're going to do your whole life. Now, I'm not saying you're going to do this. At the first, you may do it more often. But you will always do it. You may not, you may not do it every day. You may not do it every three days. But you'll know when you ought to do it. 
And that's when you'll do it. It'll be like anything else. See, the Bible is not going to prescribe that for you. It's like the Lord's table. We don't do that on a regimen like it's part of the calendar on Israel's program and we've got to observe it or suddenly God's mad about it. You'll know when you need to do it and you do it. Isn't that the way you do things anyway? When I need to do this, I get it done. If I don't need to do it, there's no sense in going. Why make a ritual out of it? And that's the way the searching of the heart will be as well. Okay. Now, i got just a few minutes left here. What I need to do here is, and by the way, I always say one more thing about this. When he says, I hate them with perfect hatred, he's not just saying, I'm mad at them and I'm looking for an excuse to carry out you know, my vengeance on them. When he says, I hate them with a perfect hatred, he's talking about, I hate them for the same reason, Lord, you hate them. Now, someone would take issue with that and say, God doesn't hate anybody. Well, the Bible says he does. There are some, there are some folks that he counts as his enemies. Now, I realize some folks don't know the difference between an ally and an enemy, and they can't make a decision about that. Your heavenly father is not one of them. He figures out who is an enemy. By the way, if you break into my home and drive me and my wife out and tear up our stuff and run your flag up our flagpole, I've figured out if you're an enemy or an ally. I don't really need a lot of coaching. Anyway, that's just my comment. But your Heavenly Father doesn't need that either. Okay, now, oh man, tired is really getting away from me. So let's go back to this man of understanding. He will attain unto wise counsels. And what I want to do now is talk to you about, in fact, I've got that verse. Let me just put it up there. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. I want to talk to you about this word attain. Um... Oh, you know what? This is going to work out perfectly, I think. Let me just look at something. No, maybe not. Um, he shall attain unto wise counsels. Tell me what it means to attain. To learn. All right, Bob says to learn, achieve. achieve. What do you, when you attain something, what do you recognize about what, about what that is? No matter what it is, when you finally attain it, what is that? What is that? You've reached like the goal. Okay, you've reached the goal. You've kind of come to the end, right? You know, if you attained whatever it was you were after, then it means that that's kind of finished, right? And so that's a fitting thing to be sitting at the, at the top of our staircase because... As the mount, because as I said to you at the start of the lesson today, the thing that your Heavenly Father was after from the very beginning was this attainment. You've already left the education proper behind because you're fully educated at the end of level two. Then you learn the education as a father. But then when you attain unto wise counsels, that's the final goal. That's really what he was after. Think about it like this. Here's a kid that goes to elementary school and he learns his ABCs and he learns his numbers. Why would you teach any kid his ABCs or his numbers? All right, to be able to communicate, to be able to function in life. Is the end result really to just be able to count to 100? That, right. He needed that to actually get to what he wanted to be in the end. What I'm saying is, back when you received Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you were justified and do eternal life, you received salvation, you were given that justification and sanctification, and you were adopted. You may not have known about it, so I waited and I put that up here, to know wisdom and instruction, that's when you know about that. So I said, okay, this is when you know that you're adopted. But your father didn't just want, that's why I said didn't want you to just get these decision-making skills. He had something way off in the future that he calls wise counsels that he was saying, this is where I'm wanting you to attain to. This is the goal. This is the mountaintop. This is it. When you get to this, 
You've gotten to where I need you to be. Now, as we look at this, that, that attain under that, and you did get that right, and, and I know I've already showed you this chart. I, went, I don't think I put George Crabs up. Maybe I did. I, I can't find my, there it is. George Crabs says this, to attain signifies to rest at a thing or a goal. It's a perfect and finished action. You see? So that's what attain is about. We, and, and then he makes a differentiation because if you say you attain something, you acquire something. He says, no, that's not right. We always go on acquiring, but we stop when we have attained. So, now, th don't confuse that with if we go all the way through this curriculum and you, you live long enough and the Lord tarries long enough and I live long enough that we all get right up here that there's not anything we haven't learned that we couldn't go back and go, oh, you know what, there's more in here. Yeah, th there will always be more in there. You can spend a whole lifetime in this thing. But you can still attain unto wise counsels. That's not unattainable, you understand. So you're not just sitting on the board, you are one of the board officers. Okay, now... Okay, now you said that, that's true to an extent, but let me now point out this. A council is the board. This is ELS. And that has to do with giving, that has to do with council. Think of a counselor. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's not, that's not completely off base, but she was saying, it's like, now you're on the board. Now, now you're not, ju yeah, you're, you're not just, yeah, yeah, now, now you're actually on the, 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 the board. And I use that to say, I want us to be careful and pay attention that it's ELS, because I, and a council would be ILS, would, uh, uh, IL, would be, we got a group of us together to form a council to make a decision about something. But this is ELS. And that, the council is what you get, uh, you could call it wisdom, you get from someone else. And that's what ELS, and that's why I said to you, I, I don't know if I said it last week or not, it was, I, I had it in the notes and I took it out. But I think I may have said it anyway, and that is, when you get to that point, you are finally qualified to give counsel. Now, look, don't misunderstand that. That doesn't mean that as you're coming along that you can't give any counsel to anybody. Of course, you'll know more than someone coming along behind you. We better not have to wait till we all become men of understanding to give any kind of counsel. There won't be any mutual edifying going on at all. But there's something, in, as you would suspect, there's something very particular about this councils that's being spoken of here. Just like this knowledge wasn't just knowledge in general, it was a specific knowledge about your reputation. Now, by the way, this is the first time we run into this word in the table of contents. It's not like those other words of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and those kinds. All of a sudden now, we get a word we haven't run into in the table of contents before. Now, i got about one minute left, and so what I need to do is kind of set something up for you here. And that is, in fact, I think I, what I'll do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this for when we come back uh, after the break. Because I have something... Um, to show you about this that I think uh, is, I've kind of saved the kicker for the second session. So we'll come back and we'll get it uh, in 